Judas back on the scene. He'd been off the scene for a little while, he'd be behind the, the, in the background, fulfilling the things that he'd devised to do. And the famous thing with Judas is that he comes and he betrays Jesus with a kiss. Now, it's not, there's not something wrong in terms of, of him kissing Jesus. It's quite a normal greeting in, in the Middle East. You know, we're a bit more reserved in this country, but if you go to France, you probably get a smacker on both cheeks if you meet, meet someone. But, you know, you read in the Bible, there's, there's you know, Moses kissed his father-in-law. David and Jonathan kissed each other as they realized that they wouldn't see each other. We're told in, in the New Testament, in the church life, to greet each other with a holy kiss. There's something that really shows a, a close sign of fellowship and relationship. And there's just something wonderful in that, that it would, be, would have been perfectly natural for Judas to have gone up to Jesus and just and kissed him in such a way as a greeting. And I think there's something so wonderful there in terms of who Jesus is to us. You know, God Almighty, Holy God, separate from us. The one who will bring judgment on sin. Seemingly remote up there in heaven. But yet, he sent his son Christ to this earth. And we can relate to God through Christ in such an intimate way that we can approach him also with a kiss. That's some of the glory of what it means to be a Christian, is that we can walk with God that close. We're not hoping that somehow this God out there might have favour on us on Judgment Day. But the moment we know him, the moment we're his disciple, we can walk with him in that intimate fellowship. It's interesting that how all four Gospels refer still to Judas at this stage as one of the twelve. Even though we'd seen at the Last Supper, it says those frightening words that Satan entered him and had gone off to betray his Lord and Master. But yet he's still described here as one of the twelve. Probably put in there to really show you something of how grievous his betrayal was. The fact that Judas kisses him at this point again shows how, how grievous this betrayal is. But it also shows us perhaps... The, the nature of the human heart is that people can have a, a pretense, they can have a mask all the way up to the very end. Pretending to be someone who God knows fully well that they're not. There's no fooling God. If we want to know God's favour, we have to be real with him. We have to come unmasked and show warts and all. Be willing to, to, to be exposed in his light. Because he knows everything anyway. Not to be like Judas and, and playing the game with this mask of still being his disciple right up to the very end. You know, something about the fear of the Lord there. It says in, in the parables that Jesus said that there'll be wheat and tares will grow up in his church. That the wheat will be the genuine believers but tares will look like believers. We need to make sure that we truly are the wheat. Christ was willing to be betrayed by a tear so that he could bring a harvest of wheat into his barn. Just wonderful the way he loves us. So Judas comes and he betrays Christ. And as we unpack this, you just get to see who people think Jesus is, even at this last hour. This has been Matthew's theme in some ways all the way through the gospel. Who is this Jesus? Judas comes and he calls him Rabbi. In verse 49, teacher. He didn't pay very much attention to what Christ had taught him, did he? In Luke's gospel, Jesus is referred to as saying, he says, Judas, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? The term son of man there is one of Jesus' favourite phrases, but look, really he's described himself as the Messiah, the one to come. But more poignantly, <clears throat> in John's Gospel, the account that we read from John 18, it says, verse 4, Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. 
And he said to them, I am he. That I am he in the Greek is, is um, ego eimi, which literally just means I am. It's the Greek translation of, of God's revealed name, the name that he revealed to Moses at the burning bush. When, when Moses is saying, whom shall I say he sent me to go and deliver the, the uh, Hebrews out of Egypt? <coughs> Excuse me. And God says, I am. It's the name of God, I am. It's the sense that I've always existed. I am. Before anything was created, I am. So Jesus in this situation is, is saying, I am. They're asking he said, who, do, who, do, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, as if he's just some common man. And he basically says, I am. I am God. You're not seeking Jesus of Nazareth. He might be, but you've, you haven't found just Jesus who's from Nazareth. But you found God Almighty. The I am. In John's Gospel before, uh, as you read the... the, the, the gospel Jesus brings out this, this I am in a number of ways seven famous ways you probably know most of them I'll just read them I am the bread of life I am the light of the world I am the gate I am the good shepherd I am the resurrection and the life I am the way the truth and the life I am the true vine whom do you see? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. It's translated here, I am he, but literally it's just, I am. That's who they were stood in front of. Not some pretender from a northern town who's come to cause a bit of trouble in Jerusalem. But I am. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Suddenly, in that moment, in Gethsemane, they experienced, all of them, something of the power of God. Just a last witness, in, in a sense, of whom they are about to crucify. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am. Could he make it any clearer as to whom they're about to crucify? They're about to crucify the Son of God. And it's a clear battle, really, this scenario. A clear battle in, in the war between good and evil. Judas, whose name means Judah. It's the same name as Judah. Born of fallen Adam, the worst sinner, filled with the devil, the son of perdition. In contrast to Jesus, also from the tribe of Judah. But Judah's got, Judas has got the name Judah. Jesus from the tribe of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The second Adam, born of God, the only sinless one, filled with the Holy Spirit. And he's not the son of perdition, but his name means the Lord saves. It's a clear battle in the war between good and evil. This spiritual battle that's worked out here on earth. The spiritual battle that we're a part of in, in our little scene here and now on planet earth. The forces of, of good, the forces of evil, the forces of darkness against God Almighty. And we see that they, they come for battle. The people come. A great crowd comes to arrest Jesus. We read in Mark that this crowd is, has come from the religious leaders, from the chiefs and the priests and the elders. It says that um, in Luke that they sent the, the officers, which were like the, the temple police. They had their own police system in the, the temple. And then John records that they came with a band of soldiers, which some commentators believe, if it was a full strength cohort of soldiers, could have been up to 600 men. They come armed. 
with an army in effect to come and arrest Jesus. They wanted to make sure this time, back in John 7, we read of an account where um, the, the, the religious leaders had sent out the temple police to try and arrest Jesus. And they, they come back failing to arrest him. They come back empty-handed. And they said, why did you not bring him? And this, the officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. They couldn't bring it, didn't have it in their hearts to arrest him. How could they arrest a man who spoke like that? But yet this time, they wanted to make sure that he was not going to slip through the net. We see something here of Judas. You know, what was truly in his heart? Did he think that he would get power and fame and recognition and riches by following Christ? Did he think that Christ would come and, and win a great victory over the Romans and Judas would be there and he'd be lauded as he's paraded through Jerusalem as, you know, in this triumphant procession? He'd had none of that with Jesus. He had to steal out the money bag to get the money that he wanted. Jesus had, you know, in, in the moment before his, his death, he's just taught them what it truly means to be a disciple. To get on your knees and to wash the feet of others. Was Judas now on the winning side? Was he now with the triumphant? Is now 30 pieces of silver richer? Is this the thing? Is this what it looks like for a human being to win? For that moment, he may have been rejoicing and thinking, wow, I've made it. But he was guilty, and his guilt would not be washed away. In fact, all of them declare their guilt in this. You know, you just look at the rabble who's come out to arrest him. The Jewish leaders, says there's a crowd, there's probably, you know, other people coming along. Roman soldiers, they're all guilty of what they're about to do. They're in a battle, a spiritual battle. It's not a fleshly battle. The battle that we're in, that, you know, as Christians, we are in a battle. But it's a spiritual battle. Peter had brought a sword along. He was still thinking, you know, last time we'd looked about the weakness of his, of his humanity. And now he's all this bravado, I'll do this for you, Lord, I'll do that for you, Lord. And then it just, just dissipates. But here he is with his sword. And he wants to do battle. I don't know what he was thinking. If you've got a crowd which could be 600 plus people. And they've come armed. And he's got a sword. He, he just plows in. Chops off Malchus's ear. Did he really think that he was going to, to win this battle? Is this really how Jesus' battles are won? That's the, the great blot on the history of the church, the Crusades. That's where the, the thinking went wrong. They saw that the Muslims had come into Jerusalem and into the Holy Land. And they thought, we should fight this with a sword. It's not how you fight the Lord's battles. Jesus says in John 18, My kingdom is not of this world. We're told in 2 Corinthians 10, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. The strongholds that come down, it's a, it's a matter of truth. It's about who Jesus really is. It's about who we really are before God. The, the sword that we wield is, is the word of God as we go out and tell people about Christ. It's about proclaiming the gospel. In the Crusades, they should have gone and they should have, they should have loved people and served them and told them about Christ, told them the way of salvation, then world history would have been different. God's ways are not brought forward by the sword. And there's a couple of reasons why we cannot extend God's kingdom through physical weapons. 
Firstly, the sense that if we do, then we'll be subject to the same punishment. Jesus warns in verse 52, if you look at that, it says, all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. There's a sense there in the Old Testament about what's right. If you take a life, your life deserves to be taken. Romans 13 verse 4 says, If you do wrong, be afraid, for he, he does not bear the sword in vain. He's talking about legal authorities above us who, who God has put in positions who can bear the sword on us if we overstep the mark. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So if we start to live by our own vigilante ways, we're likely to come a cropper under the law that God has established over us. And we thank God for the law. Yes, there are times when leaders go astray and we should pray for them and seek to change the law. But we need to thank God for those who are over us. Because they, they can be a protection to us. So there's no room in the Christian life for any vigilante self-styled justice. God wants things to be done in order. He wants things to be done right. He wants things to be done his way. The second reason why we're not to use physical weapons to extend God's kingdom is that God wants us to rely upon his power and not, not our own. Verse 53, if you have a look at that. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? 12 legions of angels. Apparently a Roman legion was 6,000 soldiers. So if you're only good at maths, that's 72,000 angels. We talked before about Jesus being the Passover lamb and, you know, the, the picture of the first Passover in Exodus. We read one night, God, that one night, God sent one angel out and he killed all the firstborn in the whole land of Egypt, except those who were, who were covered by the blood on the door lintels. One angel. <laughs> and Jesus said, don't you know that I could call down 72,000 angels? Once you start fighting in your own strength, then, then you, you cease to fight in the Lord's strength. We're in a spiritual battle. The forces that come in against us, we cannot fight against. We have no chance to fight against the devil and his demonic forces. We're completely powerless. But not if we put our faith in the one who could call down 12 legions of angels. Suddenly the tables turn. You know, it's good to have big friends, isn't it, in a, a playground fight. <laughs> but this is th like this times infinity. Both of these, these ways show a lack of understanding of God's ways. If we're trying to fight things our way, it shows that we don't really understand God and who he is. There's something so wonderful here about, you know, the essence of God is, is love. God is love. In Luke's account here, when, once Peter's chopped off Malchus's ear, we read that, that Jesus presumably picks up his ear and heals him. The last recorded miracle of Christ is healing someone who's come to arrest him and he knows what's going to happen to him. He's said it a number of times. He's going to be whipped. He's going to be ridiculed. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be spat at. He's going to be crucified. How many of us, if we're in that situation and we know what's going to come, how many of us would, would want to hurt the person who's coming towards us? And yet we see something so countercultural, so sinless that Jesus heals those who come against him. We're not to go down fighting, but we're, go, we're to go down loving right until the very end. Even when Jesus was on the cross, he's, he cries out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. 
Jesus' love just poured out. If you start to try and fight your own battles and your own strength, the love goes. Self comes in. All those ugly, selfish emotions and feelings start to come out. But Jesus was able to love right to the end. He commands his disciples to love their enemies. He actually calls Judas here friend. It's not the, the same Greek word as, as when he, he says in John 15, you are my friends if you do what I command. Judas wasn't doing what Christ commanded. He wasn't that type of friend. It, the word is, is more like comrade or companion or fellow. It's more of a distant term. Judas was no longer Christ's friend in the intimate sense. We can be. We can be transformed by the gospel. We can be born again so that we can become God's friend in that intimate way. But Judas had, had passed the, the thing. Jesus tells us to pray, f to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. Judas was beyond praying for. His, his fate had already been sealed. But yet Jesus still loved him. He still did the right thing before him. There was no hatred in his heart. There was no malice. There was no sense of revenge. He loved him. And, you know, it's a challenge to us all to keep on loving. But the other thing that taking things in our own strength misses out on is not only God's love, but God's meekness. Look at verse 54. But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? Jesus is concern here in the midst of this betrayal in the midst of about to face such a cruel death is that his concern is about fulfilling the scriptures that's the, the key really the secret of his voluntary submission that's how he can yield himself to this horror he can yield himself because, because he knows that is in his father's hands. That his father's got it all mapped out. The whole thing is mapped out. And he knows the last chapter. And I want to encourage us, you know, as, as we face difficulties, as we fit, often get into a situation where pride might rise up and we want to show people, you know, I'm going to give them, I'm going to give them back. Just to be meek. The sense of meekness is, it, it's not weakness, but it's, it's knowing that you've got an amazing power, but you don't, you choose not to, to show it. You hold back in humility. Jesus could be meek because he knew the power of, of Almighty God. He knew the power of his Father in heaven. And we too can be meek. You know, whatever we face, if we're tempted for, for us to fight back in our own strength, just remember Christ's example. Lean on Christ. Trust in his plan. He's got it all mapped out. He knows exactly what he's doing. This hasn't caught him by surprise. He's planned it. He's in control. Rest in him. Jesus was concerned about fulfilling the scriptures. He knew that it had to be God's perfect timing. He knew that he would have had to have time to prepare his disciples for his death. And more chillingly, he knew that he had to give darkness its hour. We read in Luke 22, the parallel account. Jesus says, this is your hour and the power of darkness. God had to allow the darkness to, to come forth. He had to allow darkness to have its hour. To, to show in a sense something of, of its horror. That even when he's clearly seen that Jesus is God himself, humanity doesn't want God. Humanity wants to betray God. Humanity might want to use God to prosper in this world, but they don't want God. Darkness had to have its hour. They should have been fearing fearing God but instead they're there 
dancing in innocence, rejoicing, thinking that they've got victory over God. They should have been fearing God. But even the disciples, they end up running away because they fear their own life. The fear of death had overtaken them and they fled. How easy is, is it for us to run away? When we feel it's our time up, we can be very brave and think we're not going to do it. But then, how easy it is to forsake Christ? When the armies of the enemy come against us, and it's just us stood against them, how easy is it for us just to forsake Christ and like the disciples to run away? But even in this, Jesus allowed it to happen. What for? To fulfill the scriptures. We'd already read um, last time about it being planned that the, sh the shepherd would be struck and the sheep would move. Um, but it says in John 18, If you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom he gave me, I have lost not one of them. It was all part of God's plan of salvation. Jesus knew the bigger picture. That's why he could love to the end. That's why he could be me. Because he knew the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is this, as it just says in Romans 4.24. That Jesus was delivered for our offences. He had to be delivered over in that time in, in the garden. Because this was part of his plan of salvation. And so Jesus is delivered to the, the Jewish leaders. Um, in Matthew, he goes straight to Caia Caiaphas, the high priest. In John, it says that he goes to a man called Annas, who was the previous high priest, who was actually Caiaphas's father-in-law. He'd served as high priest for four or five years. It meant to be, to be high priest, you were meant to be there for life. God terminated your appointment by taking your life, and then the next high priest would come. But it seems that at this time, the role of high priest had become politicized, probably a lot of bribery involved, <coughs> favors, intermarrying. Interesting that Annas was Caiaphas's father-in-law. And we see that Annas was, he was a man who apparently was in control <coughs> of the temple money changes and the sacrifices. It was Annas who was perhaps like the godfather over the, the temple all the money coming in the temple that so outraged Jesus when he came in and turned over the, the, all the tables. We can see a corruption here right at the heart of the high priest and yet Jesus has to stand before this high priest. And then he comes and stands before Caiaphas. Probably while he was stood before Annas, Caiaphas was getting together the Sanhedrin. Now the Sanhedrin was like the, the ruling council who consisted of 70 of the chief priests, elders and scribes plus the high priest himself, 71 men. Who were meant to be 71 godly men who were to rule over the nation. But here we have Caiaphas who's got the Sanhedrin together. Maybe not managed to get every single person together because it was a bit of a rushed meeting in the middle, in the middle of the night. But there's enough of them there to do business. And they've certainly got some business that they want to do. Peter, as we looked at last time, quite bravely manages to get into the court, as we read there in verse 58. Peter was following, following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. So the disciples had run off. As we said, Peter was a bit stronger in the flesh, as it were, in his own strength, but managed to get in, make that brave move. And he's there to see what would be the end. Well, what did he see? He saw in some ways a, a kangaroo court. We read in verse 59, the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. What's the sixth commandment? It 
Some translations of the Bible, it says, thou shalt not kill. Other translations, it says, you shall not murder. The reason they put the word murder in there is because they're trying to make a distinction between lawful killing and unlawful killing. When you look in the Old Testament law, there, was, there were certain crimes that deserved to be killed. So Peter's looking on. This Sanhedrin are only a, they're meant to punish unlawful killing. And it may involve a lawful killing. Which one are they going to get? They're pretending to be upholding God's justice, but really they're just concealing a murderous heart. The whole thing is a complete farce. They're just going through the motions of religion. That's a warning to us, to us all, isn't it? Not just to go through the motions of religion, to look good on the outside. God's not bothered about how good you look on the outside. He wants to see what's going on inside you. What's coming out of your heart? And what was coming out of these people's heart? These 71 men, if they're all there, what was coming out of their heart? Nothing but murderous thoughts towards the Son of God. Under the Mosaic law, there were certain, certain crimes deserved the death penalty, including, I'll just give you a list, worshipping idols, false prophecy, blasphemy, breaking the Sabbath, certain types of sexual sin, murder, causing death through negligence, kidnapping, hitting, cursing or disobeying your parents, disobeying the ruling of the priests. They were in a very, very powerful position. This ruling, this ruling body, the Sanhedrin. If, someone, if they made a decision and said you need to do this and someone went against their decision, in effect they're going against God. And it deserved the death penalty. So Caiaphas and his crew would, would have known this. They would know that if, if they could get an agreement, then no one can go against their decision. And if they did, it would be at pain of death. Another crime that deserved punishment was malicious witness, as we'd read earlier in Deuteronomy 19, giving a false witness in a case. Christ had the right to a fair and impartial trial. God had set up the authorities that way in Israel. But what he was about to get was just a kangaroo court. It was just a farce. It wasn't justice. It was anything but justice. So there are a number of ways why this, this court was illegitimate, why it should never stand. First one is, is that it was held at night in a private residence. Should have been held during the daytime in the temple, in the public. Jesus had no defense counsel. He was entitled to someone to defend his case. The person to be convicted would, would only, should only be convicted if, with a testimony from two reliable witnesses. And the witnesses needed to be so convinced, if it was to deserve the death penalty, they needed to be so convinced that, that when the death penalty was, was agreed, that they were the first ones to pick up the stones to stone the person to death. They had to look that person in the eye and say, I'm so convinced that you did it that, that I'm going to stone you to death. Maybe that's why when we see that they actually condemn Jesus and bring the, the guilty verdict in their view, at this particular time the Jews couldn't enact the death penalty because of the Roman rule above them. That's why they had to appeal to Pilate to get Jesus crucified. All in God's plan, all to fulfill scripture. But they do the best. We see them striking Christ, slapping him, 
spitting at him. There's a sense there that they're convinced in their own hearts that their witness, even though it's a lie, they'll stand on their witness to see this man condemned, to see him crucified. So they needed two witnesses, and we see here that they find two witnesses. Verse 60. Sorry, it says, Though many false witnesses came, they found none. At last, yeah, at the bottom of 60, at last two came forward. So they found no credible witness because they wouldn't. <laughs> Jesus had nothing to answer. How can you find sin in the sinless one? But at last two come up and, and they come forward with this false witness. And they said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. It's interesting that they bring that as, as the only thing that they can hold on to. It's, it's the thing that why this whole court case is happening in the first place. Because Jesus wasn't talking about the physical temple in Jerusalem. He was talking about the temple of his body. That his temple, his temple would be destroyed, but then on the third day it would be raised again. He was talking about his death and his resurrection. And this is the thing on which they find him guilty. This is the charge on which they find him guilty. Because he says he's going to destroy the temple. In effect, they understand what he's saying. He's saying that I'm greater than the temple. And of course he is <coughs> greater than the temple. So it was also unlawful. Because if they convicted someone and sentenced them to the death penalty, they had to wait for at least one day between the verdict and the sentence. They were going to rush him as soon as it got light. They were going to rush him to Pilate to have him crucified. There was also an exemption that no one should be killed during a feast. We're obviously in the feast of Passover at the moment. Unless it was a crime that was so serious that they had to, to kill them. Sanhedrin obviously thought that this is what was needed. But then, in their own hearts, as we read before, they'd already decided to put him to death before they'd even asked any questions. What did Jesus do? Verse 63. But Jesus remained silent. There's nothing more to say in one sense. In John's account, it says that when Jesus is before Annas and that they're asking him for witnesses, he, he basically says, um, go and ask the people who've heard me preach and seen the miracles. Go and ask them. There's enough witnesses as to, to who I am and what I've done. There's nothing really more for him to say. What more witness could he have given the people? He's taught like no other man's ever taught with the power and authority from God. He's healed every sickness and every disease. He's cast out demons. He's walked on the water. He's raised the dead to life. What more witness do you need that this man truly is the Son of God and therefore sinless? There's nothing more he can say. His silence is in itself a witness to the whole immorality of the trial that he's going through. It's also a testimony to his submission to the will of his Father. You know, Jesus, as we'd seen previously, he is the Passover lamb. He is the scapegoat on which the sins of Israel will be put upon him. And he would carry the sins as far as the east is from the west. It says in Isaiah 53, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not 
his mouth. Jesus remained silent because in one sense he was guilty. Not for his own sin, but for the sin of his sheep. But then, in his frustration, Caiaphas says, like a sacred oath in the Jewish mind, I adjure you by the living God. This is like, he can't appeal to a higher authority. I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus says, you've said so. In Mark, he says, I am. <laughs> I am. And then Jesus quotes Psalm 110, which says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Interestingly, in Matthew's account, if you were to flip back to Matthew 22, Verses 45 and 46. So we talked about Jesus being, being the type of the Passover lamb and how the lamb had to be brought into the house and examined for four days to see whether it, it was fit for sacrifice. So Jesus is there in Jerusalem, he's in his father's house. And all the Jewish leaders are, are examining him to see if he really is sinless, to see who he is, you know, who he's claiming to be. And we, we read after all the examinations, Christ turns it round before he starts to, to blast them in verse 23 with, with all these woes and, to, and starts to tell them how sinful they are. He says to them in verse 43 of 22, How is it? Then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord sit at, to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your, your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he also his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. So that was the last question that the religious authorities had asked Jesus. And now... Before Caiaphas, Jesus gives him the answer. He's basically saying, yes, I am the Messiah. Yes, I am the Son of God. And now, in typical Jesus fashion, he ramps it up that little bit more. And he not only quotes from Psalm 110, but he also quotes from the prophet Daniel, Daniel 7:13, which says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heavens there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So now he's, he's talking about one of the best known prof prophetic um, pieces of scripture in the Old Testament about the Messiah coming in power and judgment. So he's not only declaring, yes, I am God, but I'm the God who's going to come back. I'm the one who's truly the judge. You think that you're acting on God's behalf at the moment by judging me. But it's a sham, it's a farce, it's man-made, it's evil, it's corrupt. But I'm coming back as the judge of the whole world. I'm coming back in the clouds. Not from some elevated position that I've managed to get myself into through, through bargaining and bribery and corruption. But I'm coming from the highest position. I'm coming back from the throne of God on the clouds to come and bring judgment. I think Caiaphas gets the gist of what Jesus is saying to him. And so he shouts out blasphemy. Blasphemy. He says that he tears his clothes. Apparently in Leviticus, the high priest is said that because of the clothes that they had to wear that were designed by God, and they had to make them exactly to God's specifications. That the high priest could not tear his clothes. 
in the Talmud, in the, like the, the Jewish traditions and interpretation of the law, they have added a bit, apparently it says that he can't tear his clothes unless it's serious enough, and if he does, then he has to sew them back up again. But in the law itself, it says that the high priest cannot tear his clothes. Caiaphas was man's high priest in a corrupted religious system. Whereas Jesus Christ is not like Annas, he's not like Caiaphas. He is the high priest. His clothes weren't torn to fulfill the scriptures. As he's crucified on, on the cross, the Roman soldiers are, are, are described as casting lots for his clothing. Normally they would have perhaps ripped the clothes up and divided the material. But they cast lots for his clothing. His clothes were not torn. But this high priest was about to tear the curtain in the temple from top to bottom. Verse 66. What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. Quite right. If he's convicted of blasphemy, he does deserve death. Claiming to be God when you're not God deserves death. Was he guilty? <laughs> Was he guilty of blasphemy? I just love the bit in John 19 when, you know, the Romans, they had to nail something on the cross to, as a warning to people. You know, it's the way that they kept the peace. Murderer. I, you're walking past, you look at that, you think, oh, I better not murder. What did they nail up on, on Jesus, above Jesus' cross? Let me read you this from John 19. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. God had the right label on the cross. Jesus Christ truly is the king of the Jews because he is the Messiah, because he is the son of God. He truly is the king of the Jews. Everyone is described in Mark's version as condemning Christ. It says that the whole Sanhedrin there, they all condemned him as deserving death. But the thing is, is as human beings, you know, we've all done it ourselves. We've all crucified Christ. We've all judged him falsely. Some people don't even look at the evidence. They hear the name Jesus and they judge him and, and write him off. I don't want anything to do with him. I don't want that Bible bashing stuff, whatever. Some people have, have sat aloof and judged him critically and, and tried to think, like, oh yeah, I'm putting myself in the position of judge and I'm going to scrutinize to see whether Jesus truly is who he is. The religious leaders were the instigators, but the crowd would soon be shouting, crucify, crucify, and the Romans would soon be driving nails through his hands and his feet. Having surrendered his will fully to the fathers in Gethsemane, Jesus begins to drink the cup. He'll take this cup and he'll drink every last dreg of this cup of suffering so that he can redeem mankind. 
He drinks it to bring glory to his Father and salvation to those who will believe upon him. Makes us think as we follow Christ, are we willing to do the same? Are we willing to even take a sip from Christ's cup of suffering? Are we willing to be falsely accused and yet remain silent? To be grossly abused, but yet to love to the end. May the Lord give us the grace to do that, so that people will see Christ in us.